lecture I'm going to present. I'm not going. I'm not so much going to to uh, sort of recapitulate what we did in the essay because it uh, concerns a very specific problematic, which is you know about these problem neighborhoods. And I'm not going to. Uh, <coughs> I mean, in an art context, maybe that's not so. Uh, we thought it was perhaps not so appropriate. So we're more going to talk in general about the relationship between uh, art and democracy, or the. I mean, something you hear a lot that art should really take the lead when it comes to uh, radicalizing, reinventing democracy, etc. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to speak about that. Um, and in a sense, our, I mean, although the, 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 the impetus of our uh, uh, lecture is, a, in a sense, a bit of a skeptical one. Uh, we've, wrote a, we've written an essay in which we say, uh, art should, uh, the title was, art should uh, save democracy now. You know, it's absurd of all uh, you know, groups in society. It's artists who should, uh, you know, save democracy from all its perversions, uh, from capitalism, and to, uh, sort of uh, a new uh, hierarchical visions of society that uh, have um, come to the, the foreground uh, due to neoliberal and neoconservative tendencies within politics. So we, we sort of. You know, the, the paper is, is a bit of an amazement, you know, with uh, that new role for art. And um, we want to problematize that a little bit. Um, <coughs> our paper is, up, is also uh, a reaction to the thesis of, of this seminar, uh, or the thesis as we uh, sort of uh, constructed it based on the abstract, which says that, I quote here, that uh, the core of the radical potentiality of art lies in disrupting the established order and creating a space for conflict. Uh, I end the quote here. So, um, and this is what I was talking about. Art, uh, everybody looks to its art when it comes to uh, radical democracy, uh, subversion, creating a space for conflict in a situation in which uh, our parliamentary democracies have become a sort of a sh uh, showspiel. Uh, Sort of, sort of theater in which all these political sentiments are being uh, sort of played out, but which in fact uh, has been robbed from, from any uh, agency of its own because it's limited to certain uh, financial uh, criteria imposed by certain economic logics. Uh, so that in a sense, the scope of what it can do uh, about uh, for what it can change is very little, the decisions that it can take, the scope of it is very small, and also uh, this entire idea of rep uh, the fact that it's a representative democracy also problem uh, makes it even more prob uh, problematic. You know, these people that sit in our parliaments are in fact uh, some kind of elite that you know, have their own uh, way of speaking, uh, they have their own uh, circuits that make uh, that get them elected again and again, and this, uh, you know, one time, once in the four years that you can actually do something about it is also so futile that, uh, I mean, the power that you have to influence who is sitting in our parliament is so small that in, in fact, I mean, it's, it's really not democratic at all, actually. Now, what can art do about that? Um, so, as the, as the, uh, so the abstract says it can create spaces for conflict again uh, and, and not these pseudo spaces of conflict like, for instance, the parliament. Um, so in, in my lecture I will first argue that uh, one has to be very specific as to what kind of conflicts one, uh, art should create. I think that's very important. In general, I mean, nobody can be against the idea that uh, art should create conflicts, right? Uh, there's this commonsensical notion that Conflict is good, you know, it's healthy to have conflict. So we all agree about that, but still we should be very specific. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a little bit, uh, how should I say, deceivingly simple, obvious. Um, and I will pro problematize it by looking into what we've called uh, uh, cultural activism with Dutch characteristics. Uh, this is what uh, Maria referred to. Uh, in, in our work, we have been working a lot on a kind of activism that um, is very common in the Netherlands, uh, 
you know, Netherlands, uh, I mean, they have this uh, cliche that the Netherlands, everything is very ordered and, you know, this has been a tradition because the Netherlands have always had this problem with water and they had to be very, regulate everything. And we say that this cultural activism thing is also very regulated. That uh, whenever there's uh, some kind of big social operation of the government or uh, uh, market operation, what immediately gets an army of uh, cultural producers who follows in the wake of that of those oper big operations and try to all kinds of actions problematize it, you know, uh, create conflicts, that kind of thing. So it becomes almost a sort of a uh, institutionalized uh, form of art, even though, of course, it's not always commissioned by the government or by market partners. Uh, artists sort of themselves uh, themselves uh, want to play a role in that process. You know, they demand a place in that process. Um, I'm going to um, start by uh, referring to uh, what we see as one of those cultural activist pro projects. It's a project called uh, Trichtenburg. It was sort of um, an, uh, an art festival that played itself in three cities, in Maastricht, in uh, Tallinn and in Salzburg. And the idea of this project was to, uh, I mean, all these cities are very historical cities, old cities, medieval cities. And uh, they specifically wanted to um, uh, have artists work on the problems that these cities, cities are faced with. You know, the fact that there are conflicts between the tourists and the inhabitants. You know, uh, they have totally different uses of the place. Um, uh, and it's, this creates conflicts, the project uh, sort of uh, said. And uh, what can I do about that? That was basically the, the sort of... Uh, the thesis of this uh, project, um, and to, to give an idea that uh, conflict was a very key uh, ambition or term of that project, uh, one of the project uh, uh, descriptions, for instance, read that um, uh, this specific action wanted to be a platform, uh, I quote here, a platform for working out some of the conflicts which which tend to, to remain hidden beneath the smooth surface of orderly surroundings. You know, so so one really wanted true artistic means uh, sort of enhance these uh, conflicts and work with them, etc. Um, now, what I'm specifically of what interested us in this, what you could so call a sort of a, um, a conflict festival. Um, was uh, a specific uh, uh, sort of uh, conflict that um, uh, sort of occurred within the organization itself of the project. It was, uh, the, it was more uh, precisely a conflict concerning the contribution of political philosopher Dieter Sage. And Dieter Sage was invited as a project uh, watcher, what they call a project watcher, to sort of write uh, a yeah, sort of mildly critical uh, review of you know the, the, the art festival. Now, and uh, the 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 how should I say the, the real problem was the fact that Dieter Sage spoke of Maastricht. Uh, this, he spoke of Maastricht as a capitalist concentration camp of pleasure. Okay, that was his thesis, his diagnosis, you know, okay, there's a conflict between, uh, what is the problem here? Well, it's, uh, the problem is that Maastricht is a capitalist concentration camp of pleasure, okay. Now, uh, the curators didn't really like that, um, and I'm not going to go into the details, you know, why did they not like it. In fact, it wasn't very well argued why they didn't like it, but however, um, <coughs> even though they did, didn't like it, they did publish his essay uh, in the catalogue, and I mean, what is just interesting, I'm going to read it, is how they, how the reasons why they decided to publish it, even though they were absolutely opposed uh, to such a, a diagnosis. I quote here, um, so it's the curators who wrote this introduction to the catalogue. On the one hand, they say, this book represents many voiced reflections on the project from which singular voices should not be excluded. On the other hand, Lesage's thesis that the city has become a capitalist concentration camp of pleasure has met with massive opposition. He, so Lesage, advances this thesis inexorably without, in our opinion, sound and well-founded arguments. However, and this is the, an interesting sentence, however, we decided uh, to publish the text 
in order to counter the criticism that we would not allow antagonism and critical interaction. Now this last part I find, uh, we found very interesting because in a sense it makes very clear how a, a certain notion of conflict, which we will argue against this notion of conflict, is indeed uh, a sort of a norm for uh, an art that wants to commit itself to a certain social issues or public space. Um, it made it very clear, this statement, that the curators, or that today one would say the worst insult, insult one could get as a curator or an artist is that you can't take any criticism or that you don't, do not tolerate any antagonism or friction. So even though the curators were obviously against uh, this uh, thesis of Lesage, and he, they even say, well, he doesn't have a leg to stand on, it's badly argued, we don't follow it, etc. Still they decided to publish it. So uh, this is say, my first point, uh, the first point we want to make about this thing. Conflict is really uh, a sort of, um, uh, it functions as a norm within uh, contemporary art. And of course, a uh, second point I want to make here is, in a sense, the absurdity of the situation, or the absurdity this creates. Because uh, one could say, um, on the one hand, uh, conflict and critique is actively encouraged. You know, uh, one, one should remember that Lesage was even invited, you know, to write a sort of, uh, in, as an internal critic. So criticism is so important for artists that they even invite <coughs> people officially to criticize them. Now, of course, and the, the unwritten rule is one obviously that one doesn't do it, take that job very seriously because mm -hmm. you know it's, it's hard to take it seriously, and then it immediately causes a crisis. And uh, and I mean, it's obviously that it was a crisis. You, you know, the, uh, one could say, uh, for instance, what is interesting in what I read, they they say. Um, you know, we don't want to exclude singular voices, singular voices, that's a very nice way to say things we don't like, you know, uh, and it also sort of makes clear that if one really takes this uh, idea of conflict seriously, one immediately becomes, as it were, attacked in person, you know, because it was, uh, there was a problem with the sergeant himself, as a person. So, in a sense, it's a nice way to, to almost exercise the conflict, you know, it's not, we don't have a problem, you know, it, it's, you know, he's just being, uh, so radical and stubborn and he doesn't want to discuss his thesis with us, that, yeah, I mean, we have to... Uh... And so, so one can say, even though uh, conflict functions as a norm, this is the second point, uh, I would say, um, uh, on one hand, paradoxically, there also isn't really a space for, for conflict, real conflict. Um, and now I'll... Uh, Based on this uh, sort of uh, encounter between the Sarge and uh, these curators, we can actually reconstruct the idea or the notion of conflict, which we think informs a lot of these uh, cultural activisms with Dutch characteristics. Um, for that reason, I'm going to uh, read out another uh, quote from another of these uh, artistic conflict projects. A pro uh, it was a project that was called uh, Rees and Grond in uh, Dutch, but uh, it actually uh, translation is spirit and soil. And it was uh, uh, also a very uh, long term um, project that centered on the Duin and Bollandstreek in uh, the Netherlands, which is an area, one could say, the coastal area, more or less between Den Haag, Haarlem, and Amsterdam. And the aim of that project was to start up a debate about a lot of conf conflicts with which that region sort of struggles because you have a lot of uh, claims made on that area, for instance, the, the famous Dutch bulb industry, uh, illegal workers that work there, they also have a certain uh, strange role to play in that area, Skip Hall that wants to expand, uh, the local villages that wants to, you know, sort of keep their villages uh, safe, etc. So all these conflicts, this project was going to uh, do something about that. Um, and there was a documentary made, and uh, that documentary was sort of intended as a, a sort of a, an instrument to start up the debate. And I'm just going to read out uh, a passage from the catalogue in which uh, the function of that documentary within that conflict art, uh, artistic conflict festival was sort of explained. I quote, uh, The documentary depicts a number of people who are affected in different ways by the changes in the area and which react upon those changes from diverse 
contra contrasting even lifestyles. At the same time, the documentary brings under our attention the complex landscape. The documentary makes clear, and this is uh, the next sentence is uh, important, how every situation has multiple aspects, and that different opinions each continue uh, <coughs> contain their own truth. So one could say that uh, the, sort of the notion of conflict behind it. Uh, is in a sense a notion that sees everything in terms of relative truths. You know, different opinions, they all have contained their own truths. And for that reason, they should be respected. And in a sense, um, if anybody sort of is too strong about his own truth, that immediately becomes, in a way, uh, unacceptable. Because then, of course, you don't respect the fact that the truth of the other might also have its value. So what we say, what we call, uh, we sort of call this um, uh, a sort of a pluralist ideology, an ideology of pluralism. Pluralism meaning we're all different, all different opinions, but we can't find a sort of a common denominator, but that's the nice thing, you know, the fact that we all have different opinions, we should respect each other. And of course the maximum thing that then becomes possible for that kind of conflict art is to uh, remind the other that his truth is all is but one of the many, you know. So uh, one could say they organize conflicts. You now people come to the table, all kinds of different play, uh, people, market players, um, farmers, illegal, uh, uh, illegal Polish people who work on the lands, etc. They all come together, and what then the artist, the function of the artist then is to show how although they all come from with their own, you know, truth and think that you know that's the deep truth. The conflict, uh, the the sort of the, the the artist as what I call the conflict manager, then you know have to sort of say, yeah, but you you know also look at from that point of view, and you can't just you know assume that, that you know you're, you're you're right and that your interest should be taken as the interest. So in a sense, it um, one could say the the artist becomes sort of a masters of ceremony, an MC, that sort of you know zaps a little bit between all the different uh, players and uh, sort of. Uh, yeah, in a sense, it's almost a constant dialogue, of course, because then uh, uh, that's what we uh, call a solution in the form of an endless problematization. So artists step in into such a, a sort of conflict zone, and then they say, <coughs> well, one should endlessly problematize one's own position, and that's a, it's, that's a, that's already the solution in a sense. You know, that's radical democracy. The fact that we all sort of you know. Uh, recognize the relative truths of the other and then we can sort of endlessly uh, talk about it and uh, you know sort of look at the world from each other's perspectives um, and of course you know this, this the endless uh, nature of, of such a solution uh, sort of made us speak of uh, interpassive art interpassive art uh, interpassivity is actually uh, a concept from psychoanalysis, which, which is uh, so Slavoj Žižek recently put it uh, forward. Uh, and interpassivity, you have interactivity, this is interpassivity, actually means that um, the classical case is a, an obsessional neurotic who, who is in a certain analysis who constantly talks, you know, about his own problems and he constantly interprets his own dreams and, you know, he's very active, you know, the ideal analysis, one would say. But the trick is, uh, why this interpassive, is that he's so active, hyperactive, because he doesn't want his analyst to do anything, you know, to say anything or to offer an interpretation or to intervene. So actually his activity is meant to pacify the other, to make sure that nothing really happens and changes, actually. Because, of course, an obsession neurotic is fierce to the, what the other does, so he wants to sort of pacify him. And this is what we do in the passive art. Artists sometimes take the same role. They step into a conflict zone, and they actually, uh, more than anything, sort of uh, uh, cause, uh, how should I say, they, they pacify uh, the people, the actors that are involved in this conflict. You know, because they say, don't take any drastic measures, don't think in final solutions, don't absolutize your own position, but constantly negotiate, constantly see things from another perspective, which sort of makes this endless, uh, sort of endless negotiation process in which not, there's never really a stand uh, or uh, 
nobody ever takes a stand, and also the people are, are sort of, uh, in a sense, diverted a little bit of what they perhaps want to do. Maybe they feel very uh, unhappy about what happens, but uh, and which could lead to sort of a violent act or to some kind of uh, more harsh conflict with, for instance, market players that are involved in restructuring the neighborhood or politicians who are set to uh, represent their interests but actually only uh, think of how, can, how, how they can get certain peoples uh, you know, out of certain parts of the city, uh, which is actually very, uh, these are, we're talking about very repressive and uh, undemocratic processes, but uh, what we often see is that activists, because they have the specific notion of conflict, very pluralist, uh, never really uh, sort of tap that potential, never really radicalize those people into, you know, having real confrontation, political confrontation with uh, market players or, or politicians. Um, okay. Uh, and to sort of um, make my point one uh, a little bit more clearer, the sentence, without conflict it would be worse. One could say this is the motto of a lot of uh, cultural uh, activism today. Uh, in the sense that, um, you know, if there wouldn't be any conflict, it, there would be something wrong, you know. So the culture activists step in and then they sort of say, okay, you know, come on, let's stop. There must be some kind of conflict uh, here. Um, um, so uh, let me come back to this ideology of pluralism that which is behind this uh, statement. Um, this seminar was also s supposed to go about, uh, be about radical democracy. Now, radical democracy is a notion that was worked out by, uh, uh, or foremost worked out by two uh, philosophers, uh, Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouffe. Uh, and in a sense, um, so what I want now want to do is sort of bring the theory in. You know, we've now sp uh, spoken a lot about art, but how it wants to be radically democratic by uh, enhancing conflicts everywhere. Uh, but uh, the theory of radical democracy, in one sense, uh, is being followed by that kind of art. On the other hand, uh, it also sort of forgets uh, a, a more subversive aspect or more, much more an easy aspect about that theory. What is the theory of, of Laclau and Mouffe? It's basically one, okay, our society is a pluralist society, so we're all different and this creates a sort of a constant tension in society, but uh, what makes it, and this is of course what artists also uh, like to affirm, you know, while well, we're all different, pluralism, difference is great, uh, but what they, uh, the, the sort of the step that they take, which artists often do not take, is that precise, it doesn't mean that because we're all different and there's, uh, we can never sort of eradicate that difference, you know, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, there are not constantly certain uh, alliances being formed, what uh, they call hegemonies, uh, that sort of uh, un are able to unite different players within the social field. Like, for instance, uh, the example is um, that these kind of coalitions usually come to be uh, around certain key terms, like, for instance, order, or what you had in the Netherlands with uh, the, the last elections. All of a sudden, people were talking about uh, the Netherlands can do things better and differently. You know, whatever that better and differently was, it managed to sort of uh, unite different factions within uh, uh, social fields to say, yes, that is what we want, Let, let's unite our strengths. And you have very, uh, you know, very radical socialists, uh, social democrats, uh, certain uh, parts of the, that previously called for populists, they all sort of united, uh, you know, around these, uh, this slogan, as it were, Netherlands, the Netherlands can do it different and better. And this, um, so, so what, what I, I want to point uh, out to you is, is what a step that artists sometimes dare not do. Because of course, this um, one could say, okay, we have all these, <laughs> these different players in the social field, and every now and then they group around certain slogans. But this grouping takes, <laughs> takes uh, the form of a very, uh, what Laclau would call an antagonism. That means that it, it, it produces a us and a them. 
you know, we are the ones that want uh, Netherlands or think that Net the Netherlands can do it better and differently, and they are obstructing that. They are the obstacle. So it really becomes uh, from a very plural situation in which you have all these different political parties. There is a, a, a sort of binary opposition is being created. That um, what uh, La Pau Mouffe, uh, they they use uh, Carl Schmitt, uh, a political philosophers, a uh, political philosopher, uh, who had this theory of the antagonism. He said, uh, or he said, uh, the essence of politics is that uh, a sort of uh, that there uh, a situation comes into being of a friend uh, of an us and a them, uh, you know the friends and the enemy, you know this polarized moment within the social process that is <coughs> politics, and um, Ernesto Laplau and, and uh, Chantal Mouffe in the theory of radical democracy, so build on to that, that you know it's not as if they say yes you know, that would be wrong you know we're, because we're all different and the uh, side is plural and now you reduce it. To uh, a binary opposition, no, they, they don't think that is bad. Um, they think it's necessary if any, for anything to change. That's how change happens in politics. But of course, it doesn't mean that uh, this uh, this solves the question of, of that pluralism is gone. No, the plural, pluralism is still there, but temporarily, people unite under a banner, a sort of an empty slogan like "The Netherlands can do it uh, much uh, better and different." And uh, what we, we see in cultural activisms is that they don't take that more radical step. They don't take that more radical political gesture of really saying, uh, for instance, in the case of uh, problem neighborhoods, uh, sorry, these people are really being treated badly, and they should really uh, unite a front, uh, in, a, in a sort of united front, act against market players and politicians, etc. They never really take that radical uh, gesture. And that is, uh, in a sense, what we criticize. That's what, how we say, okay, conflict, okay, but what type of conflict? It should be that more radical uh, conflict uh, in the uh, move and Laplauian sense. Um, and that's also why we use uh, Jacques Rancière as a, 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 an example, um, or as, as a sort of a, a theorist which uh, can be very inspiring in uh, thinking about what such a conflict would look, uh, um, uh, what it sort of, um, uh, what it, its uh, essence is. Um, so I want to come back to, the, for instance, uh, the confrontation, or, or this its conflict between Little Massage and the cure curators. Uh, one could actually see it as uh, that more um, sort of that political moment from occurring. You know, the fact that the curators sort of say, well, you know, everybody else thinks this, and the side has some kind of in, uh, for some kind of reasons thinks the opposite, and uh, he's the one being unreasonable or irreasonable. So in a sense, uh, you know, this political this is the, the political moment in which the, uh, one could say. Uh, and this, this is what I, uh, where Rancière com, comes in. Rancière says politics is not uh, a situation in which we, as civilized people, can sit around the table, discuss our own relative truths, and then uh, 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 what he says, agree to disagree about it. You know, this is what civil people do, and this is also how the, uh, the market functions. You know, everybody has his own interests: consumers, uh, capitalists, politicians, etc. They sit around the table. And they sort of, okay, I can understand that you as a consumer or as a laborer have a different uh, interest in this, and okay, I can, I can picture that, you know, and inversely, the laborers can say, okay, as a capitalist, you also have certain interests, and you have, to, and, you know, I respect that, and, and let's, come to, let's come to a certain agreement, as it were. For Rancière, this is not politics, this is some kind of economic negotiation. Uh, his central, uh, or for, according to him, politics is about disagreement. You know, when one can't just agree to disagree, when there's actually a disagreement about the disagreement, one could say, you know, in which uh, the terms in which one disagrees, uh, the, or I would say the context in which one uh, disagrees, is being put into question. This, uh, to make it very concrete, that this would mean when uh, the moment when the labor or the consumer or the ecologist says to the capitalist, sorry, already the way in which we talk about our interests or conflicts 
uh, or in which the conflicts are managed in the form of negotiation, then that's already the problem because that uh, form of conflict is already determined by the economy. So this is the radical political moment in which uh, one starts to realize, wait a minute, the way we already the way in which we deal with our conflicts is radically uh, it's not just some neutral form it is always in uh, sort of in, in favor of certain groups of people and uh, to contest that that is actually what uh, politics is about that's the disagreement and to sort of translate it back to, to uh, this art project Trichtenberg that the incident with the sergeant what he sort of uh, laid bare <coughs> is exactly how these uh, conflict art festivals are usually uh, the notion of conflict they use you know they're very pluralist you know never confrontation never really laying it very hard always you know stressing the complexity of the situation the nuances and in a sense one believes that art is about that you know art is not about confrontation no it's always about the subtleties you know showing that uh, life is much more complex than it is well, uh, one could say if we build up, uh, build on this idea of Rossiere of disagreement, uh, or, or we think that uh, cultural activism that one really wants to be political should much more uh, abandon this more pluralist idea of art, but more uh, think in terms of disagreements of uh, what, he, what Rossiere also called dissensus, not a consensus, but a dissensus when people are really just clashing. Uh, and not just between what they say, but also between how things are being uh, said. Uh, I'm going to conclude by... Um, uh, I mean, this is sort of more or less uh, our, our finishing thought. Uh, from radical democratic to non-democratic art. Um, because in, in a sense one can say, the dominant notion of uh, definitely with a lot of, a lot of activisms in the Netherlands of radical democracy is this type of more sort of pluralist uh, uh, form of politics. Um, uh, I just want to uh, quote um, Alain Badiou here. Uh, Alain Badiou, a philosopher who is known for his attacks on democracy. Uh, he's really somebody who says that. Uh, the Western world is addicted to democracy, so it's an addiction. You know, when we come we come to see democracy as as the holiest of things. You know, it's, we, well, um, I mean, the worst thing probably what we, what can what, I mean, you can't even imagine that somebody would say, "Sorry, I'm not a democrat. I'm against democracy." Um, of course, we can sort of all be liberal about it, but when it comes push push that comes to the shelf, if somebody says that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's enough to really, uh, you know, become some kind of uh, social pariah, you know, who's still going to be talking to parties or, or uh, you know, sort of give you a job at university if, if you're, uh, you know, against democracy. Um, but he says, he, uh, he's written some thesis on contemporary art. Um, and I'm going to read out uh, thesis number nine. He says, um, the only maxim for, for contemporary art, so the maxim is sort of, uh, yeah, how do you say, an imperative or a, a guideline or something. The only maxim for contemporary art is not to be imperial. Now, it, of course, imperial, it's, it's very, uh, it refers to empire, art and agree, this idea that uh, democracy is being uh, constantly, or that there's some kind of, uh, how should I say, return to the, the good old days of the empire in which uh, certain sedimentations uh, in society are occurring um, that sort of do away with all uh, poss the possibility of democracy. Um, now what he says, not to be imperial, so uh, also means, he says, uh, that for, sorry, uh, I'm going to recapitulate that, for contemporary art, not to be imperial also means that it does not have to be democratic. If democracy implies conformity with the imperial idea of political liberty. So of course this imperial idea of political liberty, liberty is uh, precisely this uh, ideology of pluralism in a sense. You know, we can all have our, uh, 
uh, sort of, you can all have our own opinions, our own interests, that's okay. Uh, you know, some by nature uh, have a more exploitative nat uh, uh, or a more, how to say, competitive, nat uh, competitive attitude towards life, and these become, uh, you know, people who work in multinationals and others, you know, they you know, they rather sort of uh, live an easy life in the village and in the sort of the, the safe environments of, of uh, their culture. And, and so the entire world becomes a sort of uh, you know, patchwork of different types of uh, interests, almost. And that's okay, you know. Um, we, can't, we, uh, we can't all sort of become uh, the same type of global citizens, you know. There's a sort of radical pluralism on a global level. And that's okay. Um, now, what, what I found interesting in this, or what what we we find uh, challenging in this uh, thesis of Badiou, is that it, it sort of um, attacks a consensus which we think is is uh, uh, sort of um, present in uh, in art on a sort of a natural affinity between art and democracy. Um, I've actually also already spoken about this, this idea that art is something which is open, which is sensitive to difference, uh, to the plurality of being, to contingency, all these kinds of uh, almost intuitive definitions of what art is, um, sort of uh, makes one think, well, okay, then art is really uh, almost by nature um, Sort of the ideal uh, defender of democracy, um, uh, the defender of democracy against for the perversion in demo uh, democratic politics. You know where uh, there's actually no pluralism, there's no sensitive to the difference. Everything becomes a political negotiation, etc. So, but art is different. You know they really can embody this idea of democracy much better actually than politics. Um, Now, uh, what I referred to in the beginning, that we are a little bit amazed by this idea that art should almost save democracy now from all its perversions in practice, is that it is itself a very perverse relation. You know, it's, it's like, uh, okay, we politicians, we actually no longer ourselves believe in, in uh, uh, the value of, of democracy, you know, because all the decisions we, all the decisions we are taking are either uh, we can't uh, implement them because, you know, uh, we have to abide the universal rules of the economy. Uh, so when every, you know, at the time when all the politicians are cynical about uh, politics, um, it's, uh, um, then they say, okay, but an art should, uh, why, why doesn't art then, uh, you know, defend democracy? Uh, which is, of course, very, uh, how should I say, um, I mean, it's, it's almost an impossible demand also, you know, because art doesn't have the budgets or the power or the means to really sort of, you know, save democracy from collapsing under its own perversity. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's obviously, if, if such demand is being made uh, to its art, and if art would actually do it, uh, it would almost be just a mere rit ritualistic uh, thing, you know. They can perhaps uh, create an illusion or an appearance of democracy that you know democracy is still alive and a good thing, but uh, it can't be more than that. Uh, that's you know, uh, perhaps our claim or our provocation. Um, and uh, I mean, to conclude, I would say that if art um, should disrupt anything, you know, which was the sort of uh, uh, what, what was written in the outline that uh, the core or the radical pot potentiality of art lies in disrupting the established order, status quo, it should precisely uh, vehemently attack this, this new sort of division of labor between art and politics. You know, between this idea that, um, for instance, what we said about the art that is produced in uh, problem neighborhoods that are up for restructuring. This is idea that uh, all the decisions are more or less uh, unquestionable behind this operation because politics say, "Well, sorry, you know, we have to mix these population groups; otherwise, there will be uh, riots, and these areas are still are going to go uh, downwards. So we have to, 
you know, bring uh, middle class people in so that uh, those problem problematic cases learn different norms and values which are more conducive to uh, the competitiveness of the city or whatever. Uh, also, the economic uh, the economics of these operations are also, uh, you know, unquestionable. You know, there's these laws of the of the housing market, and you know, the, the people think that's how they function. So, as a consequence, we have to sort of um, uh, destroy, say, 90% of the neighborhood and build it anew. And this is the only, say, economical option to deal with these problems. So in the sense, in a context where all these, uh, almost the, the real decisions are already uh, taken in a very undemocratic way and with also uh, uh, the interests of a, a very small uh, group of people in mind, uh, artists are then asked to, as it were, give, give the victims of this entire process the illusion that uh, things actually you know, the, the, the city is still ruled by certain democratic, democratic principles. You know, so it's almost a sort of uh, a empty or ritualistic, ritualistic um, sort of thing, you know, to at least give them an idea that somebody listens to them, you know, that their interests are also uh, being taken into account. Um, so, uh, to conclude, I would say, um, in his thesis on contemporary art, but you also says that uh, in relation to the fact that, um, I mean, he says that uh, what, what artists should do, they, he says artists should become the, pity, the pitiless censors of themselves. So artists, but he says they should censor themselves. Uh, and he says it in relation to the idea that empire uh, uh, is a sort of a situation <coughs> in which it, it does not, uh, is against one could say, uh, for instance, radical art, but on the other hand, it incorporates it uh, in, as a means uh, of its functioning. Um, like, for instance, in these uh, neoliberal makeovers of problem areas. And I, I sort of to conclude, we would say that if artists uh, should censor themselves, it is exactly this impulse to save democracy from itself. This, um, what we can say, sort of a democratic uh, reflex that artists have to sort of uh, save democracy from its own perversion. Um, so, yeah, I would try to end here. That's uh, my plea for uh, non democratic artists.